Good morning and welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Good morning, good week, and uh, nice to be here. And I hope listeners are all prepared for our continuing uh, reading and discussion of the book The Global Vatican by former U.S. Ambassador Francis Rooney with a foreword by Ambassador John Negroponte. We're going to see in this book a Roman Catholic's account, a Roman Catholic's account, not a Protestant account, but a Roman Catholic account of just how much the Vatican controls American foreign and dipl- and, uh, and uh, domestic policy. We're going to take an inside look at the Catholic Church, world politics, and the extraordinary relationship between the United States and the Holy See. That extraordinary relationship between the United States and the Holy See is described in the Bible. Yes, that's right. The Bible speaks specifically of the United States and the so-called Holy See. In Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 13 speaks of the beast. And that beast, that historical beast, is the papacy. The self-styled king of kings and lord of lords in this world. He's a counterfeit and he meddles in the affairs of nations, constantly attempting over the centuries to impose its ultimate sovereign and sole will over the world's people in a new world order, which is simply a restoration of the old world order on a global scale. In Revelation chapter 13, it is spoken of a second beast, that makes an image to the first beast and causes all men <clears throat> to bow down to it. That second beast, in my humble opinion, in my studied opinion, is the United States of America. First the beast, and then the image of the beast. The image of the beast looks just like its mother. And tyranny is its calling card. Are you losing your liberties in this country? Are you seeing your country going on crusade after crusade after crusade? The American police force, the global police force, America, imposing its will on other nations for your benefit or for someone else's? That someone else is the first beast of Revelation chapter 13. The United States is ever so gradually becoming a Roman Catholic superstate. Some would argue that it has been Roman Catholic from the very beginning. The author of this book is going to set the record straight, and we're going to talk about it. But we'll begin this morning by retreating one paragraph from where we left off Friday on the broadcast, and uh, we'll continue. Beginning on page 14 in the prologue of this book, at the bottom of the page, the last paragraph, it says, Whatever challenges and changes each face, the United States and the Holy See, that is the second beast and the first beast of Revelation 13, according to Inquisition Update, remain two of the most significant institutions in world history. One, a beacon of democracy and progress. The other, a sanctum of faith. A sanctum of faith and allegiance to timeless principles. First of all, I'll comment. It is a sanctum of faith, but it's not the faith of Jesus Christ. Allegiance to timeless principles? Certainly. All the way back to Babylon. You notice this author makes no mention of the Bible. And just like most Roman Catholic writings... This this book will make very few references to the Bible and never a deferential reference to the Bible. He continues, he says, Despite the obvious differences between the first modern democracy and the longest surviving Western monarchy, that's right, the papacy is a monarchy, both were founded on the idea that, quote-unquote, human persons 
possess inalienable natural rights granted by God. Now, as I said before, I could go into a long dissertation on what human persons literally means in Roman Catholic canon law, but I'll save that for another discussion. It's a legal term. Okay, human persons is a legal term. It has specific meaning in Roman Catholic language, and it doesn't mean what you think it means. That's right. It's a, it's a Western monarchy, and both the United States and the Holy See are founded upon the idea that human persons possess inalienable natural rights granted by God. Now, I can tell you from my own personal research and lots and lots of it, that the God of Roman Catholicism is the papacy. Okay? Whatever the Pope speaks, according to Roman Catholic canon law, it is God who speaks. So these inalienable rights made reference to here are those rights given to us by the papacy. All right? And you can choose to believe that his reference is to the Heavenly Father, but I know different. Now, this has been a revolutionary concept, says uh, Rooney, when the Catholic Church embraced it 2,000 years ago and was equally revolutionary when the Declaration of Independence stated it 1,800 years later. Let me tell you, the Roman Catholic Church isn't 2,000 years old. The Church of Jesus Christ was started 2,000 years, uh, 2, years ago by Jesus Christ himself, and there's no provision in the Bible for a pope or a Roman Catholic Church except to describe the beast. Now he continues, he says, given our mutual respect for human rights, let me, let me just stop right here. If you're a regular listener to Inquisition Update, you've learned over nearly a decade that the greatest abuser of human rights in world history is the beast. The Bible tells us the truth. He's guilty of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus and all the slain of the earth. Okay, that's what is said of the beast in the Bible. Are we going to believe the Bible or are we going to believe someone else? The papacy literally took over from the old pagan Roman Empire. And we've all heard how the pagan Roman Empire fed Christians to the lions in the Colosseums, thereby making fun or uh, entertainment out of the very, very real and historical torment of, uh, of Daniel in the lion's den, where God intervened and the lion passively left Daniel alone. Well, in Rome, the lions won. Okay? Rome used the the persecution and annihilation, well, literally made a sport out of killing Christians. When the pagan Roman Empire fell into the hands of the papacy and thereby became known as the quote-unquote Holy Roman Empire, the papacy made an industry, not just entertainment, but an industry of killing God's people. First burning their Bibles, then burning those who read their Bibles, then confiscating all of their property, sending their children off to Roman to, to uh, nunneries and monasteries to be raised up Roman Catholic. Persecution on a biblical scale, and it has gone on for nearly 1,800 years. And sadly, the Christian world has all but forgotten those days. And they wrongly presume that since those days are long forgotten, they don't continue today. And I'm here to tell you, as I've said many times here on Inquisition Update, it hasn't changed other than its face a lion, <clears throat> a leopard does not change its spots. And the persecutions of true Bible-believing Christians by the Roman Catholic Church, while it used to take place in the form of inquisitions by hooded priests and the governments of nations, is now conducted on a grand scale in the form of local, regional, national, and world wars. Rome accomplishes her aims 
her destruction of what she calls heretics by the same brutal methods now powered by nuclear weapons, nuclear submarines, nuclear missiles, smart bombs, stealth weapons, stealth aircraft, stealthy ships, the most sophisticated war-making technology in the world. Remember, the United States is the image of the beast, and it is the United States that causes the whole world to bow down and worship the first beast, the papacy. And if you think this is just make-believe and just the ramblings of a lunatic, simply wait till this September, when the first Jesuit pope in world history comes and addresses our government formally, and then ask yourself the question, why? Then maybe God will bring back to your recollection some of the things that you've learned on Inquisition Update over the last decade. Now, continuing where we left off Friday, it says, given our mutual respect for human rights, I almost choke when I say that, but he says, given our mutual respect for human rights, it is natural, even inevitable, that we should be friends and collaborators. That's right, friends and collaborators, like the beast and the image of the beast. That's collaboration. It's described in the Bible. Now he says something now he says something extraordinary. He says why it took nearly 200 years for us to establish formal diplomatic relations, that is, with the Holy See, is a question explored at some length in these pages. The answer lies in our respective histories. That's right. History is very important here at Inquisition Update. He said the answer lies in our respective histories particularly in the evolution of each one's attitude toward the other. The short answer is that both the United States and the Holy See had to overcome deeply held convictions and perceptions. Listen to this. Entrenched anti-Catholicism on the part of Americans. Anti-democratic and monarchical reflexes on the part of the Holy See and that neither managed to do so until the latter half of the 20th century. <clears throat> now, I want to ask the question, if my listeners can tell me, please tell me, what happened in the latter half of the 20th century that brought an end to anti-Catholicism on the part of Americans and an end of anti-democratic and monarchical reflexes on the part of the Holy See? What took place just 50 years ago, 60, 60 years ago or so? Vatican Council II. Ecumenism. When the Roman Catholic Church <clears throat> formally put forth the ultimatum, here's how it goes. Since the early 1800s, you have been taught in your churches about a future Antichrist. And the Protestant Reformation, which started in 1517 formally, nearly 500 years ago, got its beginnings on the belief that the papacy was the beast, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. And they left the Roman Catholic Church, and they protested <clears throat> the Roman Catholic Church. That's where they got their name, Protestant, Protestant. But since you now believe in a future Antichrist, a single individual that comes just before Christ's return, and you all uniformly believe that, all of you Protestants, you have exonerated the papacy and all of its papal history for 1800 years. You have repudiated the Protestant Reformation. You have left Protestantism a smoking ruins. 
you've abandoned the idea, the foundational idea, the foundational biblical, historical, and prophetic truth that the papacy is the Antichrist. And now you believe in a single individual that hasn't come yet and probably won't come until just before Christ's return. You all uniformly believe that. Well, guess what? If you believe that now, and if you've repudiated your Protestantism, then you must come home to Mother Church. You have already come home to Mother Church. You just don't know it yet. Because if you yourselves have destroyed your own faith, you have but one choice. Roman Catholicism. You see what's happened? And not only is futurism, the idea of a single Antichrist that comes in the future, that hasn't come yet, that most people believe will never They'll never know him, never see him. He'll never be a factor in their lives because they're going to be raptured out before he comes or just after he comes or at the very end. But nonetheless, they're going to be raptured and spared any persecution despite what the Bible says. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You've got to come home to Mama Church. If you call yourself a Christian, and there's no choice now but Roman Catholicism, since Protestantism is dead, stick a fork in it, it's done, you've killed it yourself, then you must come home to Mother Church. Now, rather than making that a public debate, Roman Catholicism made that a private debate between the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church and our government. You see, the Pope claims two powers, a spiritual power, over all Christians, oh, not just all Christians, but over every man, woman, and child on the planet. That's historically the record of the decrees of the popes throughout its history. It has a divine right to define the faith and to impose its tenets upon its people through Roman Catholic canon law, through the churches, and then in order to make that sure, to enlist the help of the secular power, the civil governments of all nations, to impose through their civil laws Roman Catholic canon law, and to make you all Catholic, whether you claim to be Roman Catholic or not. Even you hold out Protestants, you're forced to observe and, and obey Roman Catholic canon law through the civil laws. And if you violate the civil laws, we all know what happens. You're incarcerated. you put in the penitentiary to do penance. You see why they call it a penitentiary? You're a heretic. You violated the law, the Pope's law, as enforced by the civil law. So you must do penance. You've been made Roman Catholic through the civil law. Now you have formally eviscerated Protestantism. And that was acknowledged at Vatican Council, too. Since, since the early 1800s to the present, you have believed in a former or a, a, a future Antichrist, then you have exonerated the papacy, and now we are going to exercise our right over the church. And not only do we have power over the churches, we have power over the civil power. We've declared it for throughout all of our history, and now we're going to demand that since all the so-called Protestants are really Catholics and have eviscerated their own faith, believing in a future Antichrist, they are all Catholics, they are all under the Pope's jurisdiction, he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and therefore now, above any other time in American history, it is imperative, it is a moral imperative, that the government of the United States do the papacy's bidding and enforce its laws. Making everyone Roman Catholic. Completely avoiding the debate in the churches. 
as a matter of fact, leaving Protestants completely oblivious to what's happened to them. But all you have to do is look at the draconian laws, the monarchical-style laws that are being passed, and presidential directives, and all the spying, and the loss of our rights, and... uh, I mean, every time you make a keystroke on a computer, it's like going to confession in a Roman Catholic confessional. You're confessing all of your sins to the priests at the NSA. Isn't it interesting that the NSA is a black building? You think that's just a a coincidence? That's right. They know everything you think, do, and say. They have access to all your records. They can listen to your phone calls without a warrant. They can arrest you, bring, come into your house at 3 o'clock in the morning, roust you out of your bed without charge, without formal charge, without a search warrant, haul you off to the pokey and keep you there as long as, you, as long as they want and deny you legal representation. That's the way it was in the old world order, and the new world order is identical to it. The Pope's in control now because the Protestants have repudiated their faith. The Pope is not the Antichrist. He's not the beast. He's the leader of the Christian world, they say, and we all ought to follow Rome's lead. And we all ought to let Roman Catholics run our government, federal, county, state, and local. It's all happened right before your very eyes, and no one has been around to explain what's happening to you. Well, I'm explaining it. Are we just going to sit back and let it happen, continue to believe in futurism? Which none of the Protestant reformers believed in. They were unanimous. You couldn't find a single one of the Protestant reformers that believed in a future Antichrist. And if any of them heard any talk about a future Antichrist, they would have choked They believed that the papacy and only the papacy could even fulfill the prophecies in the Bible regarding the little horn of Daniel, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. It was the papacy, no doubt about it. Just compare the words of the scriptures and the prophecies with history. God left it almost a virtual impossibility that anybody could be confused about who the Antichrist is. Just as the Bible and history leaves no doubt about who our Messiah is, God was just as forthcoming with us about who the Antichrist is. The Protestant Reformers all knew this. Just as easy as it was to believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of all the prophecies regarding the Christ, the papacy fulfills equally as as believably and as im unmistakably all the prophecies in the Bible regarding Antichrist. But that's not what Christians believe today. And so the papacy is free to impose its tyranny once again over God's people. When are we going to wake up? He says, the answer lies in our respective histories, particularly in the evolution of each one's attitude toward the other. The short answer is that both the United States and the Holy See had to overcome deeply held convictions and perceptions, entrenched anti-Catholicism on the part of Americans, anti-democratic monarchical reflexes on the part of the Holy See, and neither managed to do so until after Vatican Council II. For the United States and the Holy See to get in bed together, they had to fix some problems. First of all, what characterized the United States in the colonial period, and rather more than that, up until the mid-19th century, Vatican Council II, was an entrenched sentiment of anti-Roman Catholicism. Why? Because... America was Protestant, and they had a natural aversion to Roman Catholicism, just as a Christian has an aversion to Satan himself. They believed that the papacy was the Antichrist. 
Now you don't you don't open formal diplomatic relationships with the Antichrist. You don't call yourself an equal in the faith of Jesus Christ with Roman Catholics. And you don't let a member of the Antichrist Church of Rome serve equally with you in government or anywhere else. The Bible plainly says, Be not ye unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But you say, Tom, they believe in Jesus. No, they believe in the Pope. Okay? They call the papacy the vicar of Christ. Vicar of Christ means replacement of Christ. They've replaced Christ with the Pope. They admit it every time they refer to their Pope as the vicar of Christ. You see, they couldn't deceive anybody if they openly admitted that the papacy was the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the little horn of the Bible. The Antichrist deceives the whole world, and how possible to do that without first asserting itself as the replacement of Christ. And that's what they've done. But they knew that in the colonial period, and the colonies were overwhelmingly Protestant. There may have been less than 1% of the population of this country in the colonial period that was Roman Catholic. Entrenched anti-Catholicism on the part of Americans. Entrenched. Where did it get its entrenchment? For the 1,500 years of history before the colonial period. When Rome controlled the kings of the earth and pursued God's people with every means at her disposal and literally made an industry out of butchering them and burning them at the stake, confiscating all their goods, perverting the minds of their children, and making them Roman Catholic. Have you ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs? Those are the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And who martyred them? Rome and the kings of the earth over which he ruled. You see how important it is to know history? To study history? The early Protestant reformers knew how important it was to have an accurate understanding of history. And was required, and it was required reading in the churches, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Never forget that Rome has has drenched the earth in the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. Don't ever forget it, because the minute you do, Rome will own your house. Rome will own your life. Rome will own your soul. But first, Rome has to get rid of this entrenched anti-Catholicism. And how did it do it? By promoting futurism. The belief in a single man as Antichrist who comes just before Christ's return. He won't be a concern of any of you until just before Christ's return. So now the curtain is wide open for you to think otherwise about the papacy than what the Protestant reformers thought and the early colonial colonists thought. And, go, and away goes the entrenched anti-Catholicism. Now the second part of this is, on Rome's part, she had to forget the anti-democratic monarchical reflexes. What is this talking about? You see, Roman Catholicism, from its very beginnings until the present, is anti-democratic. The people have absolutely no say in their faith or in their government. 
Roman Catholic canon law is the law, and it's imposed upon the people through the pulpits of their churches. Their cardinals, their bishops, their priests, their orderlies, all jointly hold Roman Catholics to the laws of their church and then encourage Roman Catholics to seek high government office to impose those same laws on you and me. And they've been very successful at doing that. Anti-democratic. Now, you, you think that you get to go to the polls and vote, okay? And I don't deny, you get to load up in your car, you get to go to the polls and vote in local elections, in county elections, in state elections, and in federal elections, okay, you get the vote. So does that mean the people rule? Well, it does, except the Pope picks the candidates. The Council on Foreign Relations picks the candidates. In your local government, the Freemasons pick your candidates. And what 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 significance of the Freemasons? Well, they're just a wing, the Protestant wing, of the Jesuit order. The Knights of Columbus picked the candidates. In most places in the United States, you can't even get a seat as a dog catcher without the endorsement of the Knights of Columbus. So when the political field is lined with candidates that have been approved by the local bishop of your church, promoted by the Knights of Columbus promoted by the Freemasons, Jesuit coadjutors all, whether they know it or not, you get to go to the polls. And they don't give a whit who you vote for because their man's going to win or their woman. That's how you could make a country Catholic. You'll accept Roman Catholics as candidates on the... Now they're all Catholic, whether they go to the Protestant church or not. Because they can't get elected unless they kowtow to the system. And the system is Roman Catholic. But the papacy has always been a monarchy claiming the divine right to rule over both spiritual things and over temporal things, the spiritual law and the temporal law, the civil law. It's a monarchy. He's king of kings and lord of lords, and no one has a divine right. No one has any right to contradict the pope. The pope is judge of judges, and we're going to see this right in this book, coming up just to, within the next page or two. The papacy is the judge of all the earth. Every man, woman, and child, every government, every institution, the papacy stands in judgment. And no man or institution may judge the pope. That's Roman Catholic canon law. We've brought example after example of this throughout history. The most frequent and the most common or the most uh, recognizable one today is uh, the pedophile priest pandemic. Nobody can understand how these priests just get shuffled off to somewhere else instead of getting doing hard time in the penitentiary for molesting little boys. Lord only knows how many pedophile priests there are in the world, and it would even strain God's knowledge to know how many children they've molested. And I don't mean to be irreverent, just a form of speech. God knows every soul that has been debauched by these Antichrist priests of Rome. These priests of Baal that worship the flesh and not the spirit. God knows every one of their victims and promises each and every one of them, I will judge. I'm coming to judge and to make war. But the world court saw an action filed by some of the victims of these pedophile priests 
A charge was made against Pope Benedict XVI and the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church for first perpetrating these atrocities and then covering them up and coddling the priests and protecting them from the civil law, shuffling them from parish to parish, from diocese to diocese, from bishopric to bishopric, and from nation to nation. And even if the law pursued them there, they finally wound up in the Vatican serving the Pope directly to keep them out of harm's way, to keep them out of justice. That's the papacy. That's the historical papacy. That's the injustice that characterizes the Roman Catholic Church. And the politicians protect it. The world court took that case and then did nothing with it for months and months and months and months. Finally, they had to make a statement. The statement is, well, we just can't dis- we just can't determine whether or not we have jurisdiction over the pope that was their formal statement the world court said we don't have jurisdiction over the pope we can't try this case this global priest pandemic cannot be tried in a civil court It can't even be tried in a world court because of canon law. The Pope is the judge of every man, and no man may judge the Pope. So the priests go free. The pedophiles go free. The victims long for Jesus' retribution and judgment and justice to finally come. And until he comes, there'll be no justice for them. anti-democratic and monarchical. The Pope is a monarch of the world. You see, he implies here that those anti-democratic and monarchical reflexes must be done away with by the Holy See. Have they been done away with? Clearly not. He says the short answer is that both the United States and the Holy See had to overcome deeply held convictions and perceptions, entrenched anti-Catholicism on the part of Americans, anti-democracy. You know, you got to understand why there was anti-Roman Catholic sentiment in the colonial period. There ought to be anti-Roman Catholic sentiment today if you just take the case of the pedophile priests, and that only. And forget all the other diabolical history for throughout the last 1,800 years. Forget about the Inquisitions, the Crusades. Forget about the wars against Protestants and not other non-Roman Catholics throughout history. Forget about the persecution of the Jews. Look at the priest pandemic in the world and how the priests are protected and the victims are victimized by that church. That's why there ought to be anti-Roman Catholic sentiment among Americans in this country. And never mention the fact that historically, for 1,200 years or more, in some cases, the Waldenses viewed the papacy as the Antichrist of the Bible. Now, you might well defend a pedophile, but you certainly wouldn't defend the Antichrist, would you? Well, that's what Christians do today. They defend the Roman Catholic Church. They defend the papacy as not the man of sin and the son of perdition, the Judas priest, the one who betrays Christ with a kiss, but the leader of the Christian world. The moral, the most moral entity on the planet. It's unbelievable the blindness, particularly in the United States of America, the very image of the beast.
the latter half of the 20th century. Let me be specific. 1965. Vatican Council II. But you know what the sentiment was in this country when Protestant was cool? Quote, Congress will probably never send a minister to his holiness, unquote, wrote John Adams, the great-grandfather of Henry Adams, in 1779, voicing the opinion shared by many of his compatriots. Why was it many of his compatriots? Because they were nearly all to a man. Protestant. Congress, the government of the United States, would never send a minister or an ambassador to the Pope. Why? Because they believed he was the man of sin. The Antichrist. He says, nor, added Adam, should Congress accept a nuncio from the Pope, quote, or in other words, an ecclesiastical tyrant which it is to be hoped the United States will be too wise ever to admit into its territories, unquote. Guess what? We invite not only just nuncios, but we invite the man of sin himself. Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI, and now, God forbid, the first Jesuit pope of history, Francis the first. And not only are we inviting him to this country, we're allowing him to speak to the government of the United States of America, once Protestant. It's inconceivable, the blindness in this country. Are you beginning to comprehend what I say when I say the papacy is the beast and the American government is the image of the beast? Sounded outrageous before, didn't it? Well, it doesn't sound outrageous now. Here's a Roman Catholic author admitting that early Americans, colonial period, Congress will probably never send a minister to His Holiness. That was John Adams, the great grandfather, great grandfather of Henry Adams. He wrote it in 1779. He voiced the opinion shared by many of his Protestant compatriots. And Adams added, and never should Congress accept a nuncio from the Pope. Hell, they don't accept the nuncio, they accept the Pope himself. And nary a word of protest, and anybody who protests must be a religious fanatic. Well, you can call me religious fanatic if you want. I stand in protest against the man of sin. Yes, I believe in Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God, which took away the sin of the world on the cross. And we have that guarantee because God ripped the veil of that temple from top to bottom, exposing the Holy of Holies. Never should there ever be a curtain between God and His people. I believe in Jesus, lock, stock, and barrel. I believe all he's, all of the Bible. He's my Savior. But I also expose his diabolical, satanic nemesis. The one who the Bible says will deceive the whole world. The papacy. You call yourself a Christian? You know who Jesus is? Well, good for you, absolutely. But do you protest the Antichrist? Do you warn others who have embraced him? Touch not the unclean thing? Are you doing your job just to go to church every Sunday and sing in the choir and pray and read your Bible and never know who the man of sin is? And never warn anybody about him? Who's blowing the trumpet in God's house today? Who is blowing the trumpet? 
of warning in God's house today. Rooney continues, he says, some Americans still question our diplomatic relationship with the Holy See. <laughs> Do tell? How many can you count, Rooney? A half a dozen? You can't find any in the mainstream media. You can't find any in the alternative media. You may find one or two in on shortwave, which nobody listens to. You can't count any of them in Congress. Oh, they've invited the Pope. Come on, Mr. Pope. You, you tell us how we should live. Who, who's warning God's people today? And what credibility do they have? And how many Christians can you list that go after them to try to attack them? Try to silence their voices even among those who still have ears to hear and eyes to see. Try to dis discredit them by any means necessary. Like this is some kind of a competition. It's disgusting. Some Americans still question our diplomatic relations with the Holy See. You can count me as one of those Americans. They do so either citing the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, that it's unconstitutional for the United States government to accord diplomatic status to a religious body, or assuming that as a matter of real politic, the relationship is inconsequential. Let me tell you something. Yes, you've heard me mention the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. There's the wall of separation between church and state. You've heard that one, too. But the most powerful, the only relevant prohibition is the Bible. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. What does it mean if we touch the unclean thing? He won't receive us. Listen, if you have ever had an opportunity, a genuine, legitimate opportunity to question the sanity of our government, to criticize our government, is that they have violated the Scriptures passed Roman Catholic canon law and imposed it upon you as though you were Roman Catholic. Caused you for, to forget your Protestant heritage. Because in a Protestant land, no pope would be allowed to set foot on our shores. Every pope would live day to day in fear for his own life. And no Roman Catholic, if they were allowed in this country, would ever serve in a position of responsibility. That's Protestantism. And to you, most likely, if you're a futurist, this sounds hateful. You think this sounds like hate speech. That somebody like me ought to be taken off the air. But when you condemn me, you condemn every single one of the Protestant reformers. You condemn every one of the Waldenses. You condemn every one of the Albigensians, the Lollards, the Hussites, the Protestants. You condemn all of God's house because they protested the Antichrist. They protested it long before the Protestant Reformation. They protested it all the way back to Paul's congregations during his ministry because they knew who the man of sin would be. It would be whoever stepped up in place of the Roman Caesar. And history leaves absolutely no room for doubt who that was, the papacy. When the pagan Roman Empire became the holy Roman Empire, <clears throat> until the Caesars could be removed and taken out of the way 
the popes could never have stood up or they would have lost their lives. But it was after the Caesar left Rome and took up abode in Constantinople that the papacy filled the power vacuum, took control of Christianity, and it has controlled it ever since. Except for God's people. The protesters. Those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You believe in Jesus? Praise God. But what about his arch enemy? What about the one who has deceived the whole Christian world? What about the one who will be standing in front of the cameras of the world addressing the, the government of the most powerful nation on earth? The one that resembles the beast more than any other. Will you protest? Or will you remain silent to save your life? I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>